It's 1971, the year of the first microprocessor, the year Walt Disney World opens for business, and the year Alan Shepard played golf on the moon. But it was also a time when humble engineers conversed with musicians who were at the forefront of technology. These two very different groups of people were speaking of the future, and by 1971, the sound of the future was largely created by one instrument, the Mini Moog. Hello, you don't know who I am, and really, why would that matter when I'm surrounded by such elegant machines such as these? And it was the predecessor of these machines, the Mini Moog Model D, that changed the face of popular music around the world. Suddenly, the Mini Moog seemed to be everywhere. It was quickly embraced by the gods of the new progressive rock, where fantastic imagery and futuristic sounds were the order of the day. But the Mini Moog wasn't only the domain of long-haired rockers and flowing capes. It was also represented in every major musical genre of the decade. Jazz heavies like Chick Corea used the Mini Moog to invent a new method of soloing, bending notes courtesy of the pitch wheel, a radical new controller design that set the instrument apart in the eyes of performers. And Kraftwerk, that legendary German band of electronic pioneers, used the Mini Moog to craft their vision of tomorrow. Their groundbreaking 1974 single, Autobahn, laid down the foundations for all electronic pop that followed. But it wasn't just musicians who were interested in the future that turned to the Mini Moog for its sound. Reggae superstar Bob Marley brought the Mini Moog to his flavor of roots music when the band first turned up in the UK to perform on the BBC. And as the decade drew to a close, rock futurists such as Gary Newman opted to feature the Mini Moog and synthesizers like it while stepping completely away from organic instruments entirely. Before it made its way to the stage, however, the Mini Moog found its origins here. On a small main street in the sleepy town of Trumansburg, New York, the future of music was being soldered together one circuit at a time. R.A. Moog Incorporated began as a cottage industry that made guitar amplifiers and an odd electronic instrument that you didn't even have to touch to play, called the theremin. But as pop culture came to a boil in the mid-60s, so did the ideas in the head of one Dr. Robert A. Moog. By the end of the decade, his name would be known the world over because of a new modular instrument that he and his tiny workforce created on modest wooden tables and benches, the synthesizer. The Mini Moog was smaller and infinitely more portable than the groundbreaking modular systems that had made Dr. Robert Moog's name synonymous with synthesizers. The idea? To create a device that would take the sonic power of the mammoth Moog synthesizers and put it in the hands of keyboard players everywhere. And one of those men who was there alongside Bob Moog when this magnificent instrument was born was Bill Hemsath, one of Moog Music's earliest engineers. Out of spare parts lying around his attic office, Hemsath assembled the first Mini Moog prototype during his lunch breaks, the Model A. Now I'd open my desk drawers, take an apple out of one and take a module out of the other. <laughs> now, my office was up on the second floor, and I was next to the graveyard, and that's where Bob tossed stuff that was junk, but maybe we could use it someday. There was a five octave keyboard, but he would steal keycaps off of the treble end for, you know, replace chipped and broken ones. The number of remaining keycaps determined the size of the keyboard, and it turned out to be three octaves. So I hacksawed that down, and there was just a little bitty notch left in the in the left cheek. 
and I needed something there, well, how about a slide pot? That would fit. So, you know, the forerunner of the wheel was that slide pot just to fill in the space in the, in the left cheek. And then there was an upper console case, four feet long, but the end was broken out. I would take the upper console, cut it down to match, and with a little bit of fudging, it, it fit. I, I could get, how many modules was that? About a half a dozen across. I was able to find everything in the junk except for um, a 901A um, oscillator controller. I had to steal that from the uh, stockroom and bolted them together. This was the first time in history that a keyboard was bolted to a, a synthesizer. Over the next two years, three more prototypes were made and a number of futuristic designs were considered. But in the end, a simple wooden case cut from walnut boards was deemed to be the perfect presentation for this revolutionary instrument. From its inception, when musicians speak of the Mini Moog, the talk is about its unique sonic characteristics. As Bill Hemsath tells it, that sound was partially the result of a minor miscalculation on the part of one of his colleagues. Our instrument had punch to it because we inadvertently overdrove the filter like crazy. Uh, Jim Scott did the filter and the voltage controlled amplifiers. He made a calculation error and he overdrove the filters by 10, 12, 15 dB, something like that. And nobody knew that until a month or two after we started in production and everybody said, leave it alone. Yes. The other thing, the other one is that back in, this is 1970 roughly, integrated circuits were horrible. You don't put audio through one of those rotten integrated circuits in those days. And so I purposely kept the whole audio path, discrete transistors and lovely, lovely sound. So it's the overdrive and the use of, of uh, discrete transistors throughout the whole shebang. Nowadays we have good audio integrated circuits, but not back then. It was those slight deviations that gave the Mini Moog its characteristic sound and caught the imaginations of musicians the world over. At the time, no one knew it, but those were the first steps of the synth pop insurgency of the coming decade. It was an insurgency that began with this small wooden box to my right. But don't take my word for it, some anonymous narrator in a fetching corduroy jacket. Put the word Mini Moog into the Google machine and see how many seminal album titles you get back. You'll quickly see that our voyage doesn't end here. <laughs> 